All right, now I can see my notes and things I will cue me in. So uh, who am I? I'm uh, currently a uh, principal systems engineer at Smartsheet down in Bellevue, Washington. I have about 30 years, probably actually a little more than 30 years experience with Unix, primarily Unix. I try not to use any of those other evil OSs like Windows. Um, so um, with that 30 years experience, I've actually been programming a little bit longer than running Unix, but I probably have more operational Unix experience than I do development. So I'm not like a hardcore developer where I'm writing code for that full 30 years. It's been point pieces, things to work on uh, automating operational stuff, writing some code to uh, develop for my own projects and so forth. I do a larger number of languages. I've, I've, I can't even tell you how many languages. I used to keep counting it was up around 17, 18 languages I knew and worked with a long time ago. and I don't even keep count anymore. I've worked in both small uh, environments. So we're talking up to 50 to 100 computers. Um, that was working for like National Semiconductor, supporting uh, design centers, with all the uh, uh, semiconductor engineers uh, doing stuff. Two extremely large environments. I used to work for eBay, so you can imagine that there was, all I can tell you is there were tens of thousands of machines that I was administrating at that time. So it's very, very large, extremely large environments. Um, and like I said, I have a multitude of operational knowledge, probably more operational because that's mostly where I've geared most of my work over the past uh, 10 years or so. So if we start looking at service discovery, in the beginning we had, and I'm talking way back, we're talking hard-coded. And it's because when ARPANET started, they were only planning on anywhere from a couple dozen to a couple hundred machines. Why would machine names change? Can't we just put it in code and and find the machine we want to talk to? That makes perfect sense today, doesn't it? How many people want to hard code their host names into their code and maintain that? Yeah, no one. Unless you want job security. <laughs> That's probably not the job security you want. Mostly what most people do, and, and it's still very much uh, prevalent today, is using config files. Everything from like Java, um, properties files, if you run in a lot of Java stuff, a lot of people do it in Java, the Java property files, the war, uh, XML, or what is it, web XML for the, uh, some of the JBoss stuff. You know, all those sort of things are great. It's a step beyond, because now it's easier to configure. You're, you're separating out your configuration from the code. That's a good thing. But it's still, it's okay if you're a very small, couple instances you're running, you can quickly update and move forward. <laughs> Uh, it works better if you're doing through, like, today we call it uh, continuous integration, where you can make a change and it immediately gets pushed out and deployed for you. As you start to scale to be bigger and bigger and bigger, that becomes a real logistical problem because now, how many hundreds or thousands of machines do you have to go update and, and get that config file updated? The other big problems you start to run into is I've worked with, and at eBay, we had a config file for our search backend that were several hundred entries. Where in that file are you editing? Are you actually making changes on the right lines? If you're modifying a couple machines to do a test or something, yeah, you can do it, but it's a, it's a, it's a pain in the butt to open up, be scrolling through, scrolling through, scrolling through, trying to find that one line to change. Um, not to mention that, oh, you're, you're manually typing, you put a semicolon, you put something else out in there, it breaks the syntax, now you've got a service that's not coming up. So it's not a scalable solution. It's not that good. But it is still widely used. And, you know, you go find tons and tons of other uh, software out on that, even on GitHub, that everything's configured through the uh, configuration file. And for a lot of solutions, that's about the best it's going to get, because you're not going to go put a whole infrastructure in place to do your service discovery. I'm sort of on the fence with that, but for the most part, for a larger enterprise, it's not a great solution. But then we start to wake up, we find, oh, we've got things, magical things like DNS SRV records. How many people know of or have used SRV? Okay. How many people have actually written code to use SRV records? <laughs> One. Actual code, like to look up the SRV record and configure your service? A absolutely. Okay. Um, it goes through. Uh, 
get host by name, and there's a uh, block that goes along with it. Yep. It tells you what field. Yep. But it doesn't work on IPv6. No, that's true. Um, so SRV records were sort of nice because it provides the flexibility. You can change and have every all your services out there look at that same SRV record and, and update. But there's a few problems with that aspect. So yes, it is easy to update. So it's easy for the operations staff to update a DNS record. It's really, really hard to get it right in code. It's you got all sorts of timeout issues. You get to understand that your uh, DNS servers may not all update at the same time. Uh, the, there is no standard library for doing this. Uh, and then you get to things like the Java JVM. When the Java JVM starts up, it loads up. Uh, what you do is say, I want to connect to Google.com, whatever host you're connecting to. It will go out, talk to the DNS resolver. It will get the IP address for that host name. And it will keep it. It will never, ever look at your resolver ever again until you restart Java, until you restart the JVM. So the nice thing about that is, great, I've got the DNS problem. I'm not necessarily failing. The bad thing is, I made a change. I can't get my application to see that change until I restart it. So you, you, got, you sort of have both worlds. You, you want really both of them. You can't have both specifically in Java. There are other... Uh, environments that do the same thing where they don't refresh. Um, you also have uh, uh, issues sometimes with the caches on hosts. The, uh, uh, not named D, but the NS switch uh, or NSCD is actually the uh, uh, daemon that does it. The NSCD on a Linux host will usually keep that uh, host to IP mapping in a cache for who knows how long. So even if the DNS service did get updated, the host may not be letting the application know that it has been uh, updated. So you have all those sort of timing issues. Uh, if you're looking for quick deployment and rollouts, that becomes an issue. Uh, even during a restart of like a Java JVM, that can become an issue because you may have, it may have just cached a few minutes before. You restart the JVM, guess what? You're getting the same uh, IP information. So you didn't get, you didn't get the update. So SRV records are a great step until you start adding the caching in and all the other programming issues that become an issue, uh, that appear with those uh, items. Uh, sorry, I should have moved on to this one. Um, again, the timeout issues, misconfi misconfiguration. That's another big one with uh, the operations <coughs> staff. A lot of operations have tried to automate DNS, and they do a good job, but specifically <coughs> the people that don't, break their DNS uh, maps periodically. Is that a good thing? No, because now all of a sudden nothing can talk to anything until you get your maps fixed. Uh, we've talked about the applications not refreshing. Um, and it's, it's just because DNS is difficult to work with. I mean, from the command line, we all know in applications use it, and, and you can use the uh, libc routines that go out and do the resolve but actually calls the resolver library. It's live, live resolve and so forth. But if you really get down into it and you want to write the code, it gets very difficult. Yes, go ahead. Now, have you run into a lot of DNS cachers that aren't honoring TTL? I have not. I'm, I'm sure there's a few out there. But um, I would end up periodically, like with NSCD, I've, I've had to, specifically when I was at National Semiconductor running the NIS domain, periodically go run... Uh, NSCD minus I and hosts, and that would invalidate the host cache, so it would start to reload. But I do remember vaguely that there were times when even that didn't quite fix the cache on that host. There were times it would just, and I would have to go through heck to try to get that fixed. Sometimes it was even reboot the host to force everything in memory out and reload. Um, so I don't, I don't have any actual knowledge of a host cache that Inval that doesn't pay attention to the time to live. So, but I would I can imagine that there's probably some, um, not that uh, um, DNS mass does this, but something like DNS mass that is used a lot for DNS caching. There's probably something out there that says, oh, we we know better. I know they're telling us it's only an hour long, but we'll hold it for eight hours. Yeah, I can see that. 
So, anything else? so we, we, we have DNS, that's great. It moves, moves us forward in trying to figure out where our services are and, and so forth. And then comes along multicast DNS. How many people have really ever used multicast DNS? Actually, probably everybody in the room has used it, just never really knew it. It's gone by a number of different names. ZeroConf, Rendezvous, Bonjour. Rendezvous and Bonjour are the two Apple names. Um, used to be known as Rendezvous until there was a trademark dispute and then they renamed it Bonjour. Uh, officially, it's known as uh, DNS SD for DNS Service Discovery. Um, great idea on paper, very, very bad in uh, operation. Um, it's great for very small networks. And even on small networks, it's buggy. You'll uh, sometimes not see the broadcast, and so as a result, not seeing the broadcast saying, here's the service, you don't know it's there. Now, it does periodically rebroadcast, re say, the service is here again, but it takes time sometimes, and even, even then, sometimes you don't get the updates. There, there have been times when you can have the, the machine sitting right next to you, and you just never, ever see an update come through. Um, so that's the propagation issues. The inconsistent results has always been a, a bug that's plagued uh, multicast DNS. Um, certainly on a larger scale, no one in their right mind would probably ever consider this. I'm sure even Apple did not even consider using Bonjour, Rendezvous, whatever you want to call it, on their large scale systems. Um, is that pretty chatty? It is fairly chatty, yes. Yep. So, all right, so if we sort of look at what we've talked about so far, the hard-coded, of course, it's way too rigid, so that's a big no. <laughs> Config files, they're not scalable. They're used, and, they're, and that, I almost want to say not no, but yeah, it's still no, especially if you're really considering an uh, enterprise solution, something you want to make fairly bulletproof uh, and, and something that may grow fairly big. Uh, DNS SRV records, they're difficult to implement. And of course, multicast, as we said, is just way, way too buggy. So that's another big no. So we start thinking about where we're at today. We're, we're sort of getting to a lot more cloud being pervasive. You know, the, uh, we've had cloud for a while, and everybody's been sort of used to it now. But it's becoming more and more. You see a lot more enterprise organizations building their own clouds. Uh, even the old brick and mortar sort of large scale data center uh, people. I'm trying to think who who it was. Just basically shut down almost all their data centers and moved them to AWS. That was about a, within the last year or two they've done that. Uh, I almost want to say it was GE. Uh, so you start looking at uh, uh, people like that that are moving to a, a cloud environment. Now they've got to take all these legacy applications to figure out how they c connect them together. There is no good solution to that, unfortunately. There's just not. Um, but cloud environments are very dynamic. They're, things are moving around. It's not saying that your application is going to be running and immediately be shut down and be moved over somewhere else, but it could. You never know. It could be a, a machine has failed. It could be a resource requirement or a, uh, the provider saying, oh, we're going to do maintenance on a, a bank of machines and start shutting machines down. So the cloud environment's always been a, it's running, but don't count on it. Don't, don't plan on it always running and plan for failure. Um, you have the support of cloud and on-premise. So you may be a hybrid solution. You may be in AWS, and you may still have on-prem. You may have your own data center. You need to figure out how to make your application work in both locations. I'm actually in that world today. Today, we're actually all on-prem at Smartsheet. But we have plans of having more cloud-based stuff, too. So how are we going to uh, manage the services between both those environments? Um, this is sort of an interesting one that sort of solves and doesn't solve the problem of using load balancers. <laughs> Does so everybody know what I mean by a load balancer? Anybody not know what a load balancer is? Okay, I'll take it that everybody knows what a load balancer is. Then. Um, so in the, in the case of, a, and I probably should have put a couple diagrams in here so people would understand a load balancer, but in the case of a uh, 
service discovery using a load balancer in a cloud environment, and if you look at something like Mesos and even Kubernetes, they do basically the same basic principle, where you have a load balancer, whether it be a physical or a uh, software load balancer like AWS, they all have a, a list of members, a list of uh, services that are running out somewhere on all the machines. They have a list of all their IPs and what port numbers to contact those services on. And then the front end of the load balancer has a single IP and a single port that all your services talk to and get dispatched to one of those members. Um, on the service, that's a great idea, and it, it works reasonably well for a lot of basic level stuff, but as you start moving things around quickly, or uh, sometimes you don't need to put a full load balancer in front of something for a service to be able to talk to another service. If you have, uh, um, where you, you have, you, I'm trying to think of a scenario, you, ha you build a service that relies directly on a second service. Let's say uh, you have a, f a backend client talking to a database. This database is never going to really scale. You're not going to scale it out to three or four with r replicas and try to load the uh, reads against all those replicas and so forth. But you have a simple database and a server that just needs to talk to the database. The, um, do you really need to put a load balancer or put the money into a load balancer to get there or, or take a portion of an existing load balancer? Because even though you only take a small portion of that load balancer, there's still an expense with that load balancer. There's a maintenance cost. There's an operational cost to that. Is running the uh, the power costs that load balancer. Even though that traffic might be light, there's still a cost associated there. And you start aggregating all these little point solutions through a load balancer. You now have a load balancer filled up. And you have to go buy another load balancer. How much is that? Ten thousand, twelve thousand, easy for a decent load balancer. Um, so. If you have services talking point to point, why throw it to a load balancer? Um, so that, that is not always an ideal solution to me if you use a load balancer. Um, continue to use why we use load balancers. The good thing about load balancers, and I'm not saying load balancers are bad. They're definitely a good thing. They do, definitely have their uses. In, a, in the cloud environment, specifically like AWS, uh, Google uh, Compute Engine, anything like that, their load balancers are actually really software load balancers. They're all sitting there watching their whole management bus, looking for change, state changes on their machines. And when they say, oh, your, your service that was running on this machine just moved, they can immediately update their tables on their software load balancer. So in that case, that's a good thing. That's what you really want to happen. You want that quick movement. Um, the non-load balancers, require a lot of hand-holding. You need to have people that really know load balancers pretty well to be able to configure. There's a lot of configuration to existing load balancers, such as a uh, F5, what sort of uh, um, TCP stacking you use. You're going to use the uh, fast L4, you're going to use an optimized, you're going to use a standard TCP. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, there are all sorts of uh, bits and pieces to configure. The software load balances that most of the cloud providers have are tuned toward HTTP, and they do most everything well, although you can tweak them a bit. Uh, so this is just really becomes an operational issue of how much it, uh, you're going to uh, manage that load balancer. And if someone makes a configuration mistake, it can be deadly. Um, but yeah, again, they're not a complete solution. They, they solve a lot of issues. They, they certainly solve the scalability of your service, but they don't solve, in my opinion, a full uh, service discovery. And I got another thing on, what did I put on here? Um, again, sort of re reiterating, it's a manual configuration. It's easy to mess them up. I've seen uh, people mess up a load balancer and take down a service for minutes which if you're running serious money through a, a system, that can be very detrimental to your career sometimes. So what do we do for better service discovery? Well, a lot of people have been moving toward a distributed, resilient key store. That's 
really where I think a lot of the uh, uh, solutions are going to drive to. I, I personally like etcd. So Zookeeper's been around there around for years, and it's actually quite good, but it is a bit heavy in resources. Um, I came from a company that ran a lot of Zookeeper, so I know Zookeeper almost inside and out very well. Um, it's very nice, it, but it doesn't have a good, it's got a reasonable programming interface, but it's not an easy programming interface all the time. Uh, etcd, in my opinion, is much easier. It's, much more along the lines of uh, what most people are doing today with REST calls. Console is very similar. Uh, I actually just prefer etcd. It just seems to be more natural to me than console. Um, but console definitely lends itself to service discovery too. And there's a lot of products out there using console for service discovery. Uh, they're able to keep up with the changing state in your dynamic environments because they do a very quick, they're all geared mostly on uh, memory key stores. They do write, persist to disk, but they do uh, keep all your uh, configuration state of memory so they can do quick reads and writes. Um, they also, because they're resilient, you are have that uh, um, ability, ability to actually lose a host or two without affecting your, your, uh, your key store. And this is what I really like about using these guys for service discovery is that you can store your configurations up there too and allow your services to come up with a, and get their configuration. So now I'd like you to think for a second. Now, if you think about service discovery traditionally, it's always been, I know what my host name is going to be or I have a place I can go look up my host name. But if you start thinking about a cloud environment, think about what if you don't know the host name? What if you don't even know really what the service name is? So let's imagine for a moment, what if your service could start to query for what type of uh, service it's looking for? I need an SQL data store that allows geographic information. Well, Postgres has geographic uh, data uh, information in it, or you can store geographic information in it now. What if you could tag your services so you had a MySQL and a Postgres, and if, if your service came up, you would then say, I need a SQL database with geographic, and it can then magically start to resolve. Yes, I need, a, uh, need to connect to the Postgres database, not the MySQL database. I want to connect to a message bus that supports PubSub. You know, instead of just connecting to any uh, message bus, something that might only do fan out, might not do PubSub, might just, you know, these sort of issues are not really in use today, but this, this is where things are going to be going because as we go forward, I, I believe the services need to get more and more like where Docker is trying to get to. A lot of people are still, a lot of people talk about it, and there's some people actually doing immutable Docker containers. Well, I think eventually the service need to be immutable so your service never changes. You, you, it's more of like a 12-factor service where you're sending your configuration in from the outside, whether it be environmental variables, looking up in etcd, zookeeper, or someone like that. Uh, and there are people doing that today. It's just not as widespread yet. Um, need to find a memcache cluster. OK. So you know, th these are sort of semi-intelligent things that services are going to start to look for and not just be, oh, I, I need, just need a memcache. Or I need, they're going to be able to start having a, um, eventually a abstracted API so I can talk to five or six different caching solutions because they all talk a standardized format but I'm really looking to target a specific type of cache solution and I can start to ask intelligent questions for that. So what does service discovery need? Well we already know we need fast updates. We get dynamic environments. Things are happening very quickly. Machines moving in and out. If you're on a very large network, you may lose a couple machines. That's OK. They drop off. Operations gets a few more machines up. They come up. So we're always, we're always making changes. Uh, service availability. A lot of things have it today. Um, I will go into this in a, a slide or two, probably about two or three slides a little bit more. Um, but traditionally, there's only been one health check saying, basically, I'm, I'm here. I'm alive. 
Uh, if you start looking at some of the newer things, like uh, specifically Kubernetes, I know does it. Um, I think there's one or two others I've seen. But Kubernetes has two health checks. One that basically says the service is alive. I'm alive. Don't kill me. I may not be taking traffic, but I'm still alive. I don't want to be killed. Uh, and then the second is a readiness check of basically I'm ready to take traffic. So that in the event you have a, a, a service that basically has to do some offline processing or take itself offline to reload an index or whatever it needs to do, if you, if you structure it with just a single uh, health check, the, the scheduler may determine, oh, I'm not seeing the health check return because I've only got the one health check. I'm going to kill it and restart it. Well, that's probably more detriment, uh, probably worse than just letting it survive or stay up for a while. So tags, this is really sort of where some of the magic I see coming in. Uh, this goes back to one or two of the previous slides of asking intelligent questions. As we start tagging our uh, services with intelligent information, a metadata in a sense, um, and it's, it really comes down to what, how do you want to try to configure your service? How do you want to try to ask the questions is what's going to drive what the tags are going to be. Uh, it could be uh, one of the things I was going to put on the previous one. It might be I need a data store, a volume, or and say a, a, a block storage. I need some block storage that is SSD backed versus spinning disk. How do I determine what that difference? Well, the way I determine the difference is how I define tags. Uh, metadata, I define more of a configuration aspect. Um, and that sort of, it really doesn't really per, uh, pertain really to service discovery itself. It's just something I see developing for services that uh, we sort of have it today, but it will become more uh, prolific as we uh, move to something like this where we actually start having real service discovery through a key value store. Because now I can store my configuration information, keep my service immutable and then get my configuration through the uh, key value store. And uh, including things such as, and I think I actually sort of slightly talk about this on the slide, references to things like vaults. So I can go get my uh, auth, uh, auth information, auth uh, the information. Um, you don't necessarily want to be putting your authentication in your key value store that anybody can see. Because in theory, all this information anybody could see. So think about that. Think of it as a reference to where you're going to store that information into a vault. Um, event notifications, that's important. That's, that's a key one that uh, not a lot of people do well today, if they're doing it at all. Most people don't. And what I mean by that, pretty much uh, the, the primary three uh, that I just put up uh, two slides ago, Zookeeper, etcd, and console, they all do event notifications. They allow whoever is connected to the, uh, to the service to say, I want to watch either this entry or this entire tree of items, of configuration data. And when it changes, notify me. That's important so that when, the, when information on the host change or information on the service changes or your host names change, your applications, your services immediately get notified and they can go reconfigure themselves. That way, it's not saying that they will lose just a little bit, but they won't be sitting there for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes going, I don't have any more traffic coming in because they haven't gotten the information yet to reconfigure. Or no one's gone to bother to restart the service, which is what typically has, ends up having to happen today. So focusing in on a couple of these things, some, some of them are obvious, but the tags, as I say, they allow us, allow us to provide uh, descriptions to the service. They provide those attributes that allow us to start to determine what service we uh, want to look for and how to find it. The key thing is we need to find a, try to figure out a good query language. Um, if you're looking at the, uh, today we're very much more like a SQL table where it's, everything is so defined. We, we know exactly what our tags are. Eventually, I think we're eventually going to get to a point where we're going to have a, uh, an actual language we're going to know about basic primitives of a service and can then query and, and determine which uh, uh, service we most likely should connect to. On the metadata, 
Um, again, we need to move our service more to immutable models. And in a lot of cases, they're sort of there. But there's a, still a lot of services that have their configuration partially baked in either into code or the configuration goes hand in hand with the service. It's not a, I've got a, I've got a mach machine and I I've take the configuration from somewhere else and apply it. How many times do you end up installing a service or a, a class of services on machines and each time you have to go rebuild and play with trying to get the configuration right? Um, so that's, that's really where I think getting that configuration out on a key value store is going to start to make it much, much more immutable. Um, and again, another, another plug on reconfiguration. Write your code so that I can reinitialize without shutting down and restarting. Or more specifically, so I don't have to have, a, have an operations guy come, down, come and restart my service. Um, so again, that's a write the code for the appropriate watcher to, to watch the uh, key value entries and then take action when you get notified. And, and that's sort of tricky in the sense of you end up having to shut down connections and restart connections to your, uh, your, your dependent services and so forth. So can't we just write a bunch of libraries to get this done? Well, it, the libraries can cover a good portion of it, but it doesn't cover everything, unfortunately. Uh, the libraries allow us to do things like my service just came up and register itself with the uh, directory, with the, uh, whether it be etcd, zookeeper, console, or whatever else comes about. And if you really wanted to, run Redis, although make sure you're writing Redis to disk so that when you restart Redis, you don't lose all your service information. Um, we can write code to start to do some uh, <laughs> preliminary query in for services. So that's all feasible. We can even, in the libraries, start writing and building some frameworks to allow us to restart our services. So that all sort of works. But it's still not, to me, a real good solution yet. And although this will get us a good part of the way. So um, at Smartsheet, I've been working a lot with Kubernetes for the past uh, several months. Um, I'm seeing a lot of pieces in Kubernetes that are driving this too. Uh, a lot of the base primitives are sort of geared that way. Um, and, you know, Google's figured a lot of this stuff out already, quite honestly. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing millions of uh, service starts a day and being able to connect up all their services and so forth. They've, they've certainly gotten their model defined. The service primitive in uh, Kubernetes is a key piece of that. That's sort of the entry point for a load balancer in Kubernetes. Uh, it's what sort of determines what all the members are and so forth. Uh, the other piece is the Kubernetes labels, right? uh, what I call tags on a previous slide. It's basically the same basic thing. Is with Kubernetes, you can set up uh, arbitrary labels on your service or on your service definitions so that when it comes up and a uh, service is instantiated on a worker node, it will now only, not only be labeled, but now you can query that label. Uh, there's nothing really in Kubernetes that allows a service to actually find out the labels of other services, but it's not all that hard to sit there and have the service talk to the Kubernetes master over the Kubernetes API to say, let me start walking through and figuring out what I need to know about from these other services. Let me, give me a, a service that does, has these labels on it. So you, it's sort of there, but it's not really defined in that sense of uh, being immediately available for a programmer to immediately use. So, um, and that's pretty much all I've got. That's sort of the, <coughs> still a work in progress on some of this stuff, and I'm certainly writing some code at Smartsheet for doing some of these things. Nothing I can release today, unfortunately, or, or talk a great deal about, either just generally. Uh, but if you have questions, you can feel free to contact me, or if there's lots of questions, or if someone says, yeah, but I don't understand this, I'm happy to sit here and chat with you. And no one's running me out of the room, so that's probably a good sign. <laughs> so, thank you.